Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to CoMotion. I'm Katie, and I work for the events team at HQ. Um, if you don't know much about CoMotion, we have three different lab spaces, Startup Hall, Fluke Hall, which is where we're at right now, and then headquarters. Our spaces focus on IT, software, fintech, biotech, um, and emerging technologies. And at any given time, we have about 90 startups working with us, which is pretty incredible. Um, next Friday, we will have another Fundamentals, May 3rd. We will have Emma O'Neill Myers and Jesse Smith from the UW Career and Internship Center. And the topic will be Recruiting 101, Building Your Brand to Attract Top UW Talent. So if you're interested in recruiting some folks for your startup or whatever it is that you're working on, this would be a great session to attend. Um, all of the uh, fundamentals and startup events can be found online, but we also in the back corner have um, a full event schedule as well as our website information. And all fundamentals are recorded. So we are going to run around with a mic when it comes to the question portion, just so that our outside viewers can also listen in. Now I'm going to introduce our speaker, Handy Young. Um, I'm going to quickly read out a bio so that we all know what she's all about. So Hen discusses the personal toll of entrepreneurship that affects all entrepreneurs and how we can enable ourselves to continue the uphill climb in her talk entitled Entrepreneurial Grit, Climbing Uphill When the Winds Are Blowing Downhill. Hen is an executive and entrepreneur coach who works with CEOs, executive women, and startup founders. She draws on 20 years experience as a human resources strategist working with CEOs and founders, building startup and early stage companies that were able to raise 300 million in venture funding, including an IPO. She is formally trained executive coach from the Hudson Institute of Coaching. Her executive and corporate officer experience enables relevant context and insights for her work with executives and entrepreneurs. Hen's deepest satisfaction comes from helping executives and entrepreneurs become experts at using their capabilities and competencies to achieve their business mission. And with that, I'd like to welcome Hen to the stage and thank you for coming out. We're excited about this event. Wow, that, that was scary. You know, listening to all of that, like, wow, who did that? And if she did, she's really old, you know what I mean? It takes a lot of time to get that kind of stuff established. Woo. Um, thank you for coming and spending your lunch hour here. Um, half of me knows that you're here because of the great free lunch. So, you know, don't feel obligated or anything like that. Um, this topic is something that's really very near and dear to my heart. Um, and you know, as I was putting together this topic, um, this person showed up in my memory that I had buried for a little while. And his name is Sung Wei. Sung Wei was a junior VC in an iconic VC firm here in Seattle. They have offices in Seattle and in Chicago. They're known for investing in um, groundbreaking, innovative, avant-garde uh, technology and companies. And I met Sung Wei when he was a board observer for the first biotech company that I ever worked in. Sung Wei had uh, long hair that he wore in a ponytail, and he wore leather jackets. His mom and dad were very well recognized and very successful in their fields of science and medicine. And when our company couldn't make its funding and I no longer saw Sung Wei, we still kept in touch. Um, he, had, he had ties to the community everywhere. Uh, didn't matter where he traveled, he had friends. I lost touch with Sung Wei for a number of years, and then he surfaced again. And Sung Wei had worked out the VC bug in his blood, and now he was uh, you know, doing entrepreneurial endeavor, and he had a co-founder, and they were in the midst of things, and we went and had breakfast, and it was just, it was phenomenal to catch up with him and hear about everything that he'd done. And then about two or three months later, I got this email from this person that I didn't know, but he said he was a good friend of Sung Wei, and that Sung Wei had left me a message. So I mean, that's kind of odd. Did Sung Wei leave the country or something? I mean, what, what happened here, right? I opened it up, and I found out that Sung Wei had gone to his most favorite place on this earth, which was Stanford, sat under his most favorite tree, 
pulled out a gun, stuck it to his mouth, and pulled the trigger. So back in those days, I thought, wow, that was really weird. That was an aberration. The reality is that entrepreneurism is a tough endeavor. And it's not a destination, it's a journey. It is something that if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to do all your life, whether you're in a job or whether you create an endeavor. And so that kind of endeavor impacts our mental health. Now, I'm not saying that you have a mental health condition. I'm saying that being in that environment can impact your mental health. So this is not just about mental health, but this is about your ability to continue on your journey and go through the many trials that you're going to have as an entrepreneur. So I'm going to unpack this for you. And before I go further, I want to acknowledge Spokane. Spokane, yo, so good to have you. All right, let's see if I can operate this. OK, let's try this one. How about this one? OK. OK, which arrow is it? I give up. It probably needs to be rebooted or. OK. It's my magnetic personality. <laughs> Actually, my mother-in-law has a magnetic thing that happens with her skin. She can't wear a watch because it dies within like a couple minutes of her wearing it. You don't give her any electronics because the moment she touches it, it malfunctions and dies. Thank you. So which arrow is it? Is it this one? OK. All right. So this, right? This is what we aspire to. This is what we would like to happen in our companies, right? We want to have some kind of headlines like this for us. You know, whatever it is that we're doing, whatever that we're building, we want to be able to say, yeah, that's my headline, right? Or appear on like the list, right? LinkedIn's top, you know, 50 most whatever companies, right? That's, that's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to get to. Oops. But this is really what happens, right? We have co-founder challenges. We have product challenges. We can't find investors. Our investors don't like the business model, right? We're running out of money, and we're not at, at revenue stage, right? The go-to-market plan is too far ahead. We can't accurately capture it. So every time we talk to an investor, they hammer us on it. We have moving goalposts, right? Um, we're having a hard time recruiting critical competencies and the talent that we need. Um, and then, of course, potential competitors are rising up on the, you know, right in front of us. And, you know, we go to people for advice, and we're drinking from a fire hose of conflicting advice, right? This, this is, these are the winds that surround us when we're an entrepreneur. And then this is the internal turbulence, right? The responsibility for other people's well-being, for their financial well-being, right? The neglect or loss of close personal relationships. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands, but if you're on an entrepreneurial journey, somewhere in that journey you're going to lose a wife or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a partner, or your parents are going to disown you because like, you've neglected them. right? Um, you're alienated from others in normal careers. right? You want to talk about what you're doing, but when you start talking about that, people in normal careers look at you and go, oh my god, what happened to you? Um, the I am my company syndrome, you know what this is? This is when everything that happens to your idea and your company, criticism, praise, failure, successes, is you feel it physically, like it's happening to you. That's the I am my company syndrome. And of course, founders eat last. So your financial uh, well-being goes completely into the toilet. And then the imposter syndrome. And it goes something like this. If they only knew that I really don't know what I'm doing, they wouldn't invest. Who am I to think that I'm going to bring this idea to fruition? Right? If they knew, they wouldn't come work for me because like, I'm really struggling. That's the imposter syndrome. Poor health. The stress of being an entrepreneur results in weight gain. And cancer now has been correlated with stress. Stress is a catalyst for cancer. 
And then premature death from substance abuse, from stress-related illnesses, and from suicide. So this is probably not a surprise to you, but let me put some more dimensions around it. All right, let's, let's look at some people who are quote unquote leaders <coughs> in our industry. Let's see what they have to say. Kaylee Ni is a managing partner for 500 startups. They started out in uh, Asia Pacific and now they're global. Several years ago, they had three suicides from their portfolio companies. It made Kaylee decide that he was gonna speak up and speak out. And so this is what he has to say. Ask someone in the startup scene, how are you doing? The typical response you get is, I am killing it. My company is growing 800% month on month and so on. But deep down inside, the product is broken, customers are leaking out, you got two months runway left, your co-founder hates you, you just made a bad hire so your team hates you, if you go back home, maybe your partner or spouse hates you, your pet hates you, and don't even know whether you are supposed to be a founder or not. He goes on to say, that's the kind of thing we don't talk to our investors, we don't talk about it to our staff, and we don't talk about it to other founders. Fear, stress, overwork, co-founder conflicts, these are the things which are deeply personal, yet they can cause a complete breakdown of a company. Have you guys ever read statistics of why companies fail? <coughs> it's because of that. It's because the team fails. It's because the team blows, uh, blows up. It's the number one reason. Brad Feld, who is a serial entrepreneur and a VC and a co-founder of the Foundry Group based out of Denver, he has been very open about his struggle with um, depression. Against the backdrop of this rah-rah, everybody's killing it, everyone's doing great language. It makes it even harder to be open about it. We're programmed and told over and over again that as leaders, we have to be strong. We have to show no weakness. That tone and that dynamic is incredibly hard to deal with, especially against a backdrop of huge amounts of stress and anxiety that gets generated by startups and the startup world. Ben Ha, CEO of Cheeseburger. How many people here know what Cheeseburger is? Do you guys remember? Okay. He, you know, his business is more than this, but you can go on his website and find like a lot of funny cat videos and pictures and stuff like that. And it's actually pretty effective in its time. He also suffers from depression. There's lot, but I want you to know this. I came across Ben Ha when I was sitting in the Ward's Banquet for Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year. He and several other companies were up for the award of the tech company for Entrepreneur of the Year. He wasn't there, his wife was there, and they won. They won Entrepreneur of the Year. And he wrote a, uh, an acceptance speech that his wife read, and it was, a, it was the best acceptance speech I'd ever heard. But that's how I came across Ben Ha. There's lots of people who go through depression without access to support. We are not those people. What creates that barrier to support is that notion that a CEO is strong, tough male figure who acts masculine and doesn't ask for help or assistance. No matter how much you have in your bank account, how much someone has given you, depression turns that into fuel for self-worth. I want to pause here for a minute and say this. And this is something I have experienced with a lot of founders and even a founder that took his company public. You know, earlier on, that whole on my company syndrome, do you remember that? I mentioned it earlier. When you're in that place, every dollar you have, every, every dollar you don't have, every accolade you have and every accolade you don't have becomes physically felt in your body. And if you are in that place, I want to give you a heads up, you're on a slippery slope to a dangerous location. So if you're there, beware. When I wouldn't leave my room in 2001, I would make something up like, oh, I've got a migraine. The money and the pressure of money is that red herring. herring. And then finally, who here knows who Rand Fishkin is? Dude, you really know your staff. Rand Fishkin is a local serial entrepreneur. He's the founder of Moz. And if you've never read his biography, you need to read his biography. It is phenomenal. Him and his mom had a printing business. 
and he realized it was going to die, so he learned how to do SEO. I hope I'm saying that right. And they became very successful. And along that journey that he started this company with his mom, who put in everything she had, he ended up having to fire her. So if that doesn't get you to read his book, there's more. <laughs> he also suffers from depression. This is what he said. By the way, his news, newest company is Spark Toro, also in the SEO space. And if you are looking for an innovative way to fund your company, go to that website. He lays it all out. He even has the forms that he used to do it. So it's a strange thing because everyone knows that under the shroud of positive posturing, every startup and every founder is struggling or has struggled. But we're only supposed to talk about what's going right. Given that dissidence, it's no wonder many of us find ourselves struggling quietly and privately. And he had a nervous breakdown, by the way. Um, okay, so by now you're sitting here going, oh my God, what have I done? I'm sitting here, how can I leave this talk? Hang on. <laughs> All right, this is why this is important. Michael Freeman, clinical professor at US, UCSF. Mental health is as essential for knowledge and work in the 21st century as physical health was for physical labor in the past. Creativity, ingenuity, insight, brilliance, planning, analysis, and other executive functions are often the cognitive cornerstones of breakthrough value creation by entrepreneurs. Did you get that? We're no longer in the age of the Industrial Revolution, right? We're in the age of the Information Revolution. Everything comes out of our cognitive abilities. If your mental health isn't healthy, then what level cognitively are you functioning at? That's what this is about. It's not about whether or not you have mental health issues in your family. That's not what this talk is about. This is to bring to light that what we do as entrepreneurs can diminish our cognitive abilities. And if we ignore that, it hampers our ability to bring our ideas to fruition. So this is super interesting. He did a study, 242 entrepreneurs. His control group were 93 people that were dem demographically same, you know, education, age, et cetera, et cetera. Self-reported mental health concerns were present across 72% of the entrepreneurs, significantly higher than the control group. 49% reported having one or more lifetime mental health conditions. 32% two or more. 18% three or more. Depression, 30%. ADHD, 29%. Substance use conditions, 12%. Bipolar, 11%. So what's the good news? It didn't matter whether you're an entrepreneur or not, right? We all have the same level of anxiety. So that's the good news. Harvard Business Review has a study that talks about, specifically to entrepreneurs, fears that motivate and fears that inhibit, all right? So the fear that motivates are the fear of basically uh, opportunity cost, ability to obtain funding or financial support, personal financial security. If your fear is any one of those, then you actually have a higher level of persistence and aggressiveness to get it done. So let me put this in practical terms. Let's say you have a choice between starting Acme Technology Company or taking that job at Microsoft. And then let's say you choose to do Acme Technology Company. The fear of what you're losing over here will drive you to, to persist and to be successful in Acme Technology Company. All right? So these three fears motivate. Okay? Motivate to persistence, to aggressiveness, to getting it done. Right? to proving that your choice works. These fears inhibit. They're, corral they're correlated to worry and less proactiveness, less activity. That fear is the potential of the idea and the personal ability to develop a successful venture. Those two fears, if you live in this realm, they will actually, this is what it does, heightens the fear of failure which drives to a high levels of stress, analysis paralysis, relentless number crunching and validation seeking, 
avoidance of making the wrong decision. So in other words, you're going to try and pursue decision making from the mindset of which is the right decision versus which decision is going to push me forward or prove my theory or disprove my theory. Right? And the other outcome of this is you're either going to set really wildly highly set goals that are like impossible or like super easy goals. Okay? So that's what these fears do. So now that I've given you a lot of the bad news, what's the good news? What, what are some remedies? This. All right? I call this the idea life cycle map. Know where you are. Because if you don't know where you are on this map, this is going to deteriorate your mental health. So let me walk you through this. Steve Blank is a professor at Stanford and a lecturer at several institutions down in Southern California. He's a serial entrepreneur, and he has a fantastic website that you know, is from his own experience and the experience of his students. And so you need, if you're, serial, you know, if you're gonna do a startup, haunt his website, okay? The map from the here to here, this, this is his map. So basically, if you get to this point, then you know that you have a scalable startup, right? And the characteristics is you have a, a business model, you have a product market fit, you have a repeatable sales model, and you can hire managers. And this is what we call beta. And so once you're in beta, you are going, you're transitioning to becoming a company. And as a company, the characteristics is you have break-even cash flow, you're profitable, you have rapid scale, and you can hire senior managers. And this is 2.0, all right? In my work here at Comotion, and in working with biotech startups, right, the problem is here. When founders don't understand that they're here, okay? You know what an idea is. That it's that thing in your head that drives you, keeps you up at night, right? That you cannot let go until you do something with it. All right, that's the idea. A proof of concept is you take that intangible and you make it so that you can feel it, all right? And then from POC, proof of concept to beta is, does it work? Does it work? Does it do what I think it's going to do? And have I tried it out to make sure that it really does that and that it's effective, right? This is called the valley of death. It's not just me, but a lot of people call it the valley of death. Here's why it's the valley of death. It's the valley of death because this is a place where a lot of entrepreneurs go and try and raise money. And the rule about money is pretty simple. I will put money in to make more money directly. I will not put money in to help you get to the next stage. I will not put money in so you can hire what you need to hire in order to get this thing to really work. That's the basic rule of investment, all right? I put money in to make money directly. So this is where a lot of Inventors and founders want to get money and they can't. This is also the place where your mental health starts taking a hit, right? Because you don't understand why people won't invest. You won't understand why nobody's returning your phone call, right? You, go, you can't understand why people aren't going to come onto your company, right? It's because it's not proven. This is where, yes, it works. Now will people pay for it? This is, will it work? So, one of the remedies for your mental health is know where you are. And if you're in the valley of death, it's called bootstrapping, it's called friends and family. Okay? All right. Now, here's the other piece about this. These will reduce your fears. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to get rid of your fear because there's no such thing. I would be lying to you. Right. So, these will help you reduce your fears. And frankly, fear is actually a good thing because it keeps us alive, right? So set priorities and not tasks. There's a big difference. If you set priorities and you go after your priorities, you'll move the ball. If you set tasks, you'll get lost in the weeds. And then you're going to look up and go, oh my god, I haven't gotten anywhere. Well, yeah, because weeds continue to grow and pop up. But priorities move you forward. Problem solve. Take your idea and go out there and let people hammer on it and problem solve it. Because if you hear things like, oh, it's 
her baby, or oh, it's his baby, and that's why he's doing that, that is a huge red flag to you that you're not doing enough problem solving around your idea and that you're protecting something and you're not allowing it to see the light of day and you're going to be in the valley of death a lot longer. Fail fast. There are ideas that are worth bringing to fruition and then there are ideas that need to fail because here's the thing, you're not only going to have one idea, you're going to have many ideas. Let that idea fail, put it on the shelf, try something else. Listen and learn. There's a balance here between listening and learning and defending what you're doing because people don't understand. And that is a really interesting balance. It is a real interesting tension and you need to figure out which, that, which one that is, right? The more that you hear the same theme coming at you, the more that you probably need to listen, right? And learn from it because this will help you reduce your fear. As I said before, entrepreneurism is a journey, it's not a destination. It's, it's not a thing like you're going to do this and then entrepreneurism is like a cold or the flu, right? You do this company and all of a sudden, bing, you're no longer an entrepreneur. No. <laughs> I hate to tell you, it's with you for the rest of your life. You're always going to look at how to do things different. You're going to always look at how do I make this happen, right? Um, and then seek support. You know, you, you're, we're not an island. There's this beautiful word, which I can't remember right now, but what it means is that no matter where you are in this universe, no matter where you are in the molecular sense or the nano sense, there is nothing that survives on its own. It's always connected. So always seek your community. And then emotional self-monitoring, -monitor right? Notice the effects of your, the way you feel on your thoughts and your behavior. So what's my bottom line? The bottom line is this, focus on your greater good. This will always keep you in a great mental space. Focus on your greater good and what you desire to bring to the world. Courage, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the ability to persist in spite of it. So if you're sitting around waiting for the fear to leave because you want that courage, uh, yeah, you, wrong, wrong combination, wrong formula, do it. Seriously, the only way to get, to get courage is to do it, right? How do babies learn to walk? They do it. They fall down on their butt. They have a big diaper, but they fall down on their butt, and then they get up and they do it again. It's the same thing. It's the only way you're going to have courage. Persevere towards long-term goals. This is why having and understanding your greater good is so important. Because if you persevere to your greater good, I want to bring medicine to the world to that family that has that child that's dying. I want to bring medicine there. Every failure along the way, every lesson along the way is just to get you there. But if you don't know your greater good and you're not persevering to a long-term goal, every failure will be like the world is ending for you. And that does not give you persistence nor perseverance. And fear of failure is a temporary state, not a trait. I made that up, by the way. That was, don't you think that was brilliant? I made that up. <laughs> um, it is wisdom building. And so, okay, so now I've told you, you know, how to mitigate and all this other stuff. How do you build mental health? Play daily. Even if it's 15 minutes, play daily. And by the way, if you say to me, oh, but coding is play for me. Oh, graphing is play to me. No, that, that doesn't count does not count. If it's related to your endeavor, it doesn't count. All right, go play. Steve Blank wrote a, a pamphlet called Epiphany. Epiphany is when you're in that place and all of a sudden, bam, it comes together. He says it happens, real epiphany only happens a couple times in your life. But you can make small epiphanies happen. And this is the formula. Cram everything that you know about what it is you're doing. Google it, read it, watch blogs, whatever. Cram your head until you cannot hold one more thing. And then go out and play. And so this is what happens. So you've crammed everything, and then you go out and play. While you're playing, the left side of your brain and the right side of your brain shake hands and go, hi, what are you doing? I know, that's what I'm doing. And you know what? That's epiphany. This is why play is so important. Quality of sleep. 
Okay, so sleep now has been proven to be one of the activators of Alzheimer's. Because when we sleep, there's housekeeping that takes place in our brain. There's this stuff that gets cleaned off of our nerve endings. And if we don't sleep well, and we don't sleep enough, that stuff doesn't get cleaned off. And so it accumulates and then we have Alzheimer's. So sleep is really important. Limit your inputs. Honestly, if you're in tech, how many inputs are you doing? How many devices do you look at? How much information are you consuming on a constant basis? All right, limit your inputs. And then gratefulness, mindfulness, and meditation practice. And before you roll your eyes and say that you're not gonna pull out your essential oils and go get your massage and sit in a quiet place, let me just say this, all right? We use our head a lot and it never gets connected to our body. But gratefulness, mindfulness, and meditation practice ties our head with our body so that we are more aware of what is going on as a whole person. Now, at this point, you're gonna hope that I'm done, but I'm not. So it wouldn't be fair of me to point out all these things and, not, and then not allow you to practice. Aren't you excited? You're gonna practice. We're gonna do some peer coaching. This is what I would like you to do. Don't get afraid, it's actually pretty good. I want you to find a partner, right? And I want you to work through this script. Now, each of you are only gonna have five minutes and I'm gonna call time, all right? Introduce yourself, talk about what you're doing, but you only do it in two sentences, right? This isn't your elevator pitch, because I'm gonna cut you off at five minutes no matter where you are. But this, what this is about, is to give you a little bit of a pressure release, all right? So, so you're gonna get as much out of this as you are real, all right? So, 10 minutes total. I'm gonna call time at five, all right, and then you're gonna switch. But just work through this script, okay? Any questions, any thoughts, any concerns, any complaints, like you're pissed because I'm making you do this. <laughs> All right, yes? Should this be like work-related or like not work-related or just like general life? As an entrepreneur, there is no distinction between work and life. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> there you go. All right, ready? Set, go. Okay. All right, how was that? Did you guys find anything interesting? Anybody want to share what they, what? What was, somebody want to share your experience? What was that like? What, what, how did you find that? Besides the fact that you guys got to talk to one another and stuff, how did you, what did you, what did you think? Anybody want to share your experience? Here, I've got a mic for you. So it was really interesting within our group because I feel like we're all in like different stages of our lives but going through similar things of looking at, you know, a school, job, how to balance that with all with life and, uh, we both kind of had our own resources and things, but we both kind of came, or all kind of came to the conclusion that when you write stuff down, you can kind of like process your craziness out of your brain onto a piece of paper nice. is really helpful. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, it's all kind of recognizing that life is crazy and being okay with it and then being like, okay, how do I get through the next couple parts? So, yeah. yeah, writing is a really great way to process your crazy. And for those who are like, I'm not a writer, I've never been a writer, I suck at writing, they're stickers. Don't laugh. There's stickers. You can paint. You can. There's crayons. There's you know. It, it just processing your crazy. There's a lot of different ways to do that, right? Not just not just journaling. Anyone else want to share your experience? Hi. Um, I think it was really um, interesting and helpful uh, to kind of be vulnerable with some, even with someone that I don't really, I just sat next to. <laughs> but um, I think it's just kind of really re liberating to just kind of like let go of all the, all the facades that we put in ourselves and just be like, well, this is, my life is a mess <laughs> and things are a mess. <laughs> and um, yeah, I don't know. I enjoyed it. It was good. <laughs> That's good, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you know, the thing is, is, is um, I'm sure you've heard this cliche and you probably said, you know, what's, what's, 
what the hell does that mean, right? When you hear things like investors invest in the founder and the team and not so much the product, but then of course they go out and do a whole thing on market, you know, to find out what the product is worth. And so you're kind of going, well, what does that mean when they say they invest in the founder and the team? What they mean is this, is do you have the cognitive ability and the emotional ability to say, dude, this is, this is a failure, we gotta pivot and we gotta do something different. And the, if they, in the past, investors invested in the product, and then when the product failed, they realized the team did not have the perseverance or the, the resilience or the cognitive ability to pivot and do something else. And so then investors, the VCs, the good ones, did a study and found out that, oh, it's the ability of the founder and the teams to pivot to have the emotional intelligence to figure out, pull their crap together when it falls apart and come up with something new. And so this whole aspect of our mental health and being connected to our head and our bodies and being able to pivot and having, uh, that's about your ability to endure and have resilience, even if your company fails, right? That you're gonna be able to pull it together. However, if you believe that in order to be successful, you have to have this facade and pretend like nothing is wrong and that you're killing it, um, then you actually um, are going to fail. And you'll continue to fail until you learn that lesson of vulnerability. And I, you know, I don't use that word a lot amongst this group, but she opened the door, so I'm using it. But that's really what it is. A um, couple more slides and then we'll be done. I want to read this to you, and I dedicate this to every one of you in this room, and I'm not pretending here. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again. Because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, but great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails, while daring greatly? So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So, here are some resources, okay? Here is a depression self-assessment tool. It's not the only one. I'm not a mental health professional, but here's one of them that I ran across that was pretty well validated. Uh, online therapy and free support group. And by the way, I think the slides are sent out, right? Or something like that. So you'll get these slides. Here is a, a list of websites and blogs. The first two are local. That's um, David Parker's. Dave Parker's is a top and female founders org. So if you're local and you want to go and be in a community and fail fast and then learn from that and reiterate, Dave Parker, I think, has what's called a six-week startup or something like that. Female Founders Org is for female founders, right? And then the rest of them are four VCs that I actually read and follow pretty closely. They are from very well-vetted VC firms. They're very good at what they do. They're very generous in that they not only write to the founders and CEOs to help them be successful, to give them pointers about being in a startup, but it's also they share their own experiences. And then the books here, all right, the first four books, Venture Deals, Startup Communities, Boards, and Life. Venture Deals, I will tell you right now, that is a secret handbook for a lot of serial entrepreneurs and even for some lawyers. Brad Feld lays it out, okay? Um, the other three he wrote, the one with the orange, the startup life. If you're married, you have a partner, you have a girlfriend, you have a boyfriend, all right, buy that for them. That will explain what is going on with you as a startup founder. The hard things about hard things is about is from Andreessen Horowitz. If you don't know their story, their, their blog is on here. You need to go. One of the most successful um, entrepreneurs, venture firms, and now they've become some sort of an investment vehicle because they're really um, into cryptocurrencies. And then the last one is Rand Fishkin, lost and founder, the one that I said he had to uh, fire his mom. Okay? And then these are my references. 
So if you want to dig deeper into what I presented today, you're welcome to go after that and look into that and read more about it, okay? So that's my talk. We have a little less than 10 minutes. Um, any questions, any thoughts, any protests, comments? Um, I guess this is what, yes. Yeah, I have a question that, uh, you know, you mentioned at the very beginning that entrepreneurs are supposed to be strong. You know, they cannot open up because of that. And also, uh, we should always, I mean, we are supposed to, or, you know, there's a uh, kind of feeling that put the, you know, give an idea that everything is going great, which is often not. But the founders in one company, say we have like, you know, three or four founders, can we open up with each other? Or does it, would it be, can we support each other and would it help? That is my question. So I will say that, it's in, I'll answer it from a couple of perspectives. I will say that I'm old enough to remember when venture capitalists, they didn't care whether or not you had a co-founder, right? And then it moved to a preference that you had a co-founder. And now it is, if you're a tech company, you don't have a co-founder, you're not going to get funded, right? Um, and so the thing about co-founders is that they understand that it's hard and they understand that in technology, one co-founder isn't going to have all the skill sets. And so that's why they want more than one co-founder. I will say that if I had a client sitting in front of me that asked me that question, I would say that they're having big problems in their co-founding team. Because a co-founding team that can't be honest with each other and talk to one another and talk about what's going on underneath the water, um, that, that co-founding team is in trouble. And so the answer to your question is yes, absolutely, you should be able to. You should be able to talk to one another. You should know what each person brings, what are the strengths, and who owns that space, and what are the weaknesses, and that they, give, they need to give that up to the other co-founders um, so that it could be a strong company. So absolutely, yes. Thank you for the question. I have a question about, um, I guess, prioritizing and um, uh, just because, like, even thinking about this activity, uh, it's hard to pick one problem. Uh, and I guess, how would you, um, how would you suggest, you know, knowing what to focus on and uh, use what you're suggesting in terms of uh, focusing on priorities? Okay. I'm gonna give, it's gonna, I'm gonna answer it pretty simplistically, basically. What is the one thing you need to do to get to money? Period. Period. So depending on where you are, if that one thing is to get your idea built into a proof of concept, that's what you need to do. Everything else is on the sidelines. You need to get to money. There's just no way you're going to get your idea um, you know, to where you want it to be without doing that. So what are the activities that not indirectly, but directly get you to money? What, what is that? Now, don't read into that that I'm saying be merciless or mercenary. But what I am saying is if you're doing activities that doesn't lead you to money, right, then you're wasting your time. Because if you don't get to money, how are you going to get your ideas out to the greater good that you have, whatever that be, right? So prioritize the activities that directly get you to money. I think, did you have a question, sir? Yeah. Can you think of some examples of people you know that uh, have ideas for play daily? Because that's like feeling words, people can't answer that. Right. Good, bad, you know, there's a lot of in between in that. Right, so what does, what does play daily look like? Yeah, for people you know that might give ideas to people, you know, here. Okay, did you guys hear that question, all right? Give some practical examples of how to play daily, all right. There's something more important in that question, and I want you to notice it, because all of you in this room have it to a certain degree, and you know what that is? Now, not, not so much him. I'm not going to say that this is him. Maybe he's asking for a friend, but he doesn't know what play daily means, and a lot of you in this room don't know what play daily means. That's bad. I'm not saying he's bad. I'm saying 
but you don't know how to play is bad. I want you to think back when you were a kid. Uh, this, is not a, this is not funny. This part's not funny. Think back when you were a kid. All right? Think about, about that one thing you did that, oh my God, you couldn't wait to wake up in the morning to go and do. Right? What was that? Was that taking apart your mom's clock and seeing if you can put it back together and, oh my God, you got three extra parts? Who made this clock anyway? Right? Uh, was, it, was it going into the backyard, you know, scrounging up stuff, putting wheels on it, and then testing out how fast you could go? Right? Was it going into your mom's kitchen and getting a bunch of stuff and then going and making this art thing that you know, was just god-awful? That's play. And so if you have to start somewhere to find out what your play is, start there. What did you do as a kid that gave you so much joy that you woke up every morning wanting to do that? And then somewhere along the line, you forgot to do that. Now, maybe you don't want to go back and take apart your mom's clock. But somewhere in the period of your life that you've gotten to here, you have play. There is something that brings ultimate joy to you, but right now you won't do it because you think it's a luxury and you think it's a waste of time and that it gets in the way of you creating your endeavor. When in reality, when you do that thing, your brain relaxes and then that thing that you've been trying to figure out for your endeavor happens. So find that, whatever it is. Is it hiking? Is it fishing? Is it kayaking? You know, is it uh, junk shopping? Um, is it coloring? Um, is it decoupage? Whatever it is. You know, what is it? Is it cooking? And you know what that is right now. It popped into your head and you said, I can't do that because it's too luxurious. I, I can't do that because I'm an entrepreneur. I got to get this thing out. And besides that, you just told me to do the thing that makes money. And that doesn't make money. <laughs> but that thing popped up into your head. I know it did just now. That's what you need to go and do. That's play. All right, one last one because Time's up almost. All right, thank you. Thank you for being here.